What's up, gang? This is Ken Zerk. Ken Zerk is a Milligan of the Trinity, and we are back on Uminaka no Naku Koroni. Uh, last episode I recorded yesterday, actually. Not yesterday, the day before yesterday. Yesterday I actually live streamed um, Call of Duty World at War. That was fun. But last episode, we were supposed to be having dinner, but like, Granddad was tweaking out. Like, bro, he was tripping. So we, we didn't have. We had to eat without them. The Oshira Mia family conference was held every year on the first weekend of October. If a normal family were to hold a so-called family conference, you'd expect it to be nothing more than a reunion of rarely seen relatives who greet each other around buckets of sushi or something. However, part of the family's great fortune had been lent out to the grandfather's children. And no one in his family was considered an adult until they had met with success in business. So this meeting was literally a conference. How much of the fortune was invested, what sort of business was conducted, how much profit was earned. As a result, how much of the fortune borrowed from the main family could be repaid. Or possibly, how much more would be borrowed for future business ventures. What lessons had they learned? What could they learn from their mistakes? It seemed that topics like these were discussed very seriously in the past. My dad said it was like lying on a bed of nails. Apparently, it used to be a very serious family meeting where people were bathed in scornful and angry voices and some people even got slapped despite their age. Dang, you a grown man letting people slap you up? However, that, th that had become a thing of the past. Now with everyone pursuing their own business ventures and achieving success, it was becoming more of a normal yearly get-together. Even so, telling grandfather about recent events was extremely stressful. So while it was nothing more than a simple get-together for us grandchildren, it was still a real stomachache for our parents. The absence of the man who was the source of all this trouble, regardless of the reason, probably made today's lunch taste much more delicious. I got my Higarashi shit though. Y'all rocking with me? Hold on. Rocking with the Higarashi. The phrase, while the demon is not around, everyone can relax, comes to mind. Anyway, let's introduce Jessica's father, whose face I haven't seen for six years. I wish I never had to see this face. He is ugly. The man sitting on my father's left is his older brother and Jessica's father. Uncle. His name sure is easy to read. No, it isn't. I don't know what that says. Kraus. Now that we've gotten used to this string of weird names, our perspective is totally skewed. So Kraus actually doesn't seem that bad. It even starts to sound kind of cool. Just like with Aunt Natsuhi. I didn't have any memories of speaking to Uncle Kraus. He had never been one to chat with children and I, I felt like he was always talking with the adults like Aunt Natsuhi. According to my father's gossip, he was a spiteful and violent man. If what he said is true, Uncle Kraus used to be very domineering from his position as the older sibling and was despised by all the other siblings. Though despite that, those siblings all seemed to be chatting happily together. Oh well, even if their relationship was bad when they were children, sometimes people grow up and live apart from each other, their relationship change. That's probably what this was. After all, they all had children of about the same age. By sharing the same family environment, they probably profited by exchanging opinions. Maybe because of that, a short while ago, the circle of parents began to discuss the exams Jessica and I would be taking. Jessica, in order to escape questions about the exams from my father on her left, purposely faced right while firing off a rapid series of comments, not giving him any chance to get a word in. Do not let that man talk. Moving on, now let's look at the opposite of Krauss and uh, the others. In the very next seat at the table, an old gentleman with a sturdy physique sat facing Kirie. This was my first time meeting him. I had only just been introduced to him, but it seems he's my grandfather's personal doctor, a man named Nanjo. I heard he used, to, he, used his own, he used to own a huge clinic on the nearby island of Nijima, but he turned it over to his son and began living a life of leisure in his old age. He had known grandfather since the very beginning, when the master was first constructed on his island, and I built up a relationship over several decades. At first, I thought that the two of them might have gotten to know each other through grandfather's suspicious hobbies, but it seemed he was actually grandfather's chess partner. I see. That kind of hobby seems very like our grandfather. What, with his love of all things Western? 
Nanjo is probably the only person who could enter Rock and Jima despite being neither family nor a servant. He looked like a calm old gentleman as he listened to the discussion between Kyrie and the other women who sat next to him. Considering how long he stayed by the side of our short-tempered grandfather, his generous heart was probably nothing to laugh at. Still, even if he was a family doctor, having anyone outside those Shiramiya family attend the family conference was a little odd. It made me think that grandfather's condition might have worsened so much it'd be a major topic of discussion. After all, George said something like that a second ago. Something about how we've been getting continuous reports since around last year that he didn't have long to live. It's nasty to think about it, but consider how rich grandfather is. At the time of his death, his, st his wealth will suddenly be released, probably along with a fair share of our parents' stomach acid. It'll lead to ulcers for everyone. After all, this sort of thing just gets messier when there's more wealth to be divided. There's a good chance we'll be talking about stuff like that at the family conference. Still, it's not like it's got anything to do with us kids. Finally, even though he hasn't shown up, let's, let me introduce our grandfather. The person who should be sitting in the incipient's chair is Ushira Miyakinzo. It really sucks. Everyone else in the family has these weird names, but he's got this perfectly normal name himself. If only his name was written Kenzo, but he let us call him Goldsmith or something. I totally freak out. As you can probably guess by now, he's a frightening person with an extremely short temper. I'm one of his grandchildren, not a son, and I haven't seen him since elementary school. Thanks to that, I have no memory of being beaten myself, but our parents were apparently raised with, a, with an iron fist. That earlier conversation between my dad and Uncle Krause about who should go convince grandfather to come down seems pretty darn funny once you know their background. Nobody wants to deal with that, man. You can't really tell grandfather's story without covering that pivotal, pivotal event back before the Showa era, 1926 to 1989. Until the Meiji, 1868 to 1912 and Taisho, 1912 to 1926, short ass era. The Oshira Mia family was great and prosperous. They owned several spinning mills, making them rich enough to double overlapping every day as the money kept rolling in. Incidentally, grandfather was a member of a branch family and had pretty much nothing to do with the main family. Not only was he weighed down the list of people who could inherit the headship, but he hardly had any contact with the glamorous main family. However, during the Great Kanto Earthquake in the year of Taisho 12, 1923, the mansion owned by the Ushirimiya family in Odawara, 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 was flattened. The spinning mills in Tokyo were all burned down in a huge fire. The Ushirimiya family lost most of its wealth and family members in an instant. Damn, them niggas dead! Spin back? I don't know. So once they started trying to figure out who the successor should be, they apparently found no one remaining except Kenzo and his branch family. In Kenzo's later reminiscence, reminiscence, reminiscences, he referred to this as good fortune, so great that it overturned fate. With that, grandfather's boring everyday life did a 180. He was entrusted with reviving the dying Ushira Mia family, which had lost nearly all of its wealth. However, just because he had been entrusted with this task didn't mean he could accomplish it. Apparently, those around him weren't really expecting much. However, this is when Grandfather began displaying his extraordinary talent and luck. Grandfather used all the family's remaining wealth as well as everything from the hair on his head to his toenails as collateral in order to borrow a massive amount of money. Once he built up a gigantic war chest, he immediately invested in businesses. It was like someone tumbling down a hill on a bike without any brakes, and then jumping onto a neighboring bike and then another one. Just so like some crazy street performance. I'll bet everyone thought grandfather had no business ability whatsoever. However, after several miracles in terms of good luck, and coincidences piling up and every chance being taken up advantage of, fucking hell I can't read, he was suddenly in control of powerful connections with the occupying forces. At that time, MacArthur and GHQ were the ultimate authority of Japan. 
grandfather in a twinkle of an eye began succeeding in business under the protection of the occupying forces, quickly becoming very rich. By this point, it was probably said to say that information, not luck, saved the day. He must have had some seriously deep connections with the occupying forces. Grandfather knew beforehand about the emergency demands that would be made for the Korean War. No, it was more than that. He must have predicted those emergency demands from the very beginning when he started investing his money. The history books make it sound like all of Japan made a large profit off the emergency demands like during the Korean War, but that isn't actually true. Only a very limited number of the super rich played the money game and made an easy profit. Most of the citizens remained poor. In other words, Grandfather was a member of this extremely lucky group of winners. I'm pretty sure this all happened during the Showa, during the year Showa 25, 1950 or so. The Great Kanto Earthquake happened in Taisho 13, 1924 or so. And Grandfather was able to revive the near dead Ushiramiya family in only about 20 years to a level even higher than it had ever been before. With that, you'd think he revived the main family in Odawara. But for some reason, he went and did something as crazy as buying an entire small island in the Izu Archipelago. Buying an entire island is not something you can ordinarily do today. However, Grandfather was clever. He contacted the GHQ and applied for the establishment of a, a marine resource base. He acquired this island as a business property, then tossed that project aside and claimed it as its own plot of land. After the war, there was prevention measures against food shortages and having the sponsorship of GHQ meant that nobody could oppose him. From what I've heard, the Tokyo metropolis of, this, of that day offered this land to him practically for free. Later, Tokyo made difficulties by telling Kenzo to return the land, but the pushy GHQ intervened. Anyways, it seems under the table bribes did their work well. In the end, the city gave up in frustration. Grandfather, with considerable skill and good luck, managed to weather the stormy seas of that period, obtaining a vast fortune in his own island. Of course, it probably wasn't all luck. He was obsessed with all things Western, which helped him cultivate his English skills. He was able to use this to his advantage to sink his teeth into GHQ. A mansion was built on the island soon after. His mansion, in fact. Grandfather, with his love for the Western style, made this once uninhabited island a canvas upon which he could realize his dreams to his heart's content. He now had a western mansion of his dreams, overflowing with emotion and atmosphere, and a beautiful garden featuring all sorts of roses. He had a private beach where nobody other than himself would ever be permitted to leave a footprint. This would be a dream come true for any boy. After that, he made good use of his huge fortune becoming a large stockholder in the extremely stable iron and steel industry and was able to live an easy and comfortable life just using the dividends. Well, he's just that incredible. This, the kind of, this kind of person usually has the ability to foresee and predict the future, or at least that is how they're portrayed after the fact. But Grandfather denies all of that, repeatedly saying that he was simply blessed with extraordinary luck. Anyway, even a lord like that can't help but grow increasingly eccentric when locked up alone on an island where all his dreams are made real. Everyone knows he had a western exception from the start, but none of our parents really know when his bizarre black magic hobby began. Did his love for black magic begin when he became fascinated with everything western? Or did his miraculously stretch of good luck while reviving the family cause him to feel a mysterious power within himself? At some point, Grandfather began to make the research of black magic his life's work. He filled his study up with suspicious books, chemicals, and magical items as he became increasingly bizarre. From what I've heard, those around him warmly watched over him, figuring that someone who had achieved success in life had the right to do as he pleased, but there's no way that's true. They were probably just creeped out thinking, that's disgusting, I don't want to get involved. Anyway. That agitated period was an age of big gambles with both opportunities and risks. Let's say Grandfather was born in this time period. He would have had no opportunities and would have advanced like a chess piece from mandatory education to college at a leisurely pace, never becoming more than an average salary man. If that happened, he'd probably have sat somewhere, happily taking behind his boss's back. No, no, not in a fancy dining hall like this, more like at a table at some bar. 
Then again, I'll bet his family conference would be a whole lot more relaxing if that were the case. Okay, that's enough about the old geezer. I need some water. Give me a second. My throat has gone to callus. Ripping microphone from here to Dallas. Okay, that's enough about the old geezer. More important, let's talk about this incredible lunch. I'm already convinced by that sashimi salad appetizer. Koda's an excellent chef. Plus, these fish were caught in the adjacent seas, weren't they? They're totally different from the sashimi you get at the supermarket. Hey, quit it, battler. Your upbringing, your upbringing will be exposed. Everyone let out a big laugh. Damn it, you, you say that even though you love those cheap pubs. I've been at many unusual places because of work, but this stands right up there with the best of them. I'd be willing to bet Goda used to be a pretty well-known in those circles. Well, I don't really know the details, but stuff got complicated at the long-standing hotel I used to work at. What with them opening a new establishment with the same name and breaking into factions or whatever it was. In the middle of all that, he was apparently forced to retire. At that time, Mom just happened to be sending out job offers for a servant. As Gota removed the empty place, he began to recount his own bumpy past without losing a smile. The world is a difficult place. However, thanks to the madam, I was given a chance to display my skills as a chef once again. This time for the Oshiro Mia family. Although I enjoy experiencing the smiles of a larger number of people, I also find it quite entertaining to perform more delicate work that could please the limited number of those who have employed me. All this is thanks to the opportunity given to me by the madam. Gota respectfully bowed his head toward Aunt Nahus Nasuhi. Shut the fuck up, nigga. <laughs> that's that that's what she said, but that's what but what I said, that's what she looks like. She looks like shut up, nigga. Just fucking cook. That's because you were the most talented of the applicants. The decision was purely objective, not based on personal feelings, so there's no need to thank me. Dang, why does Anasui always sound have to sound so indifferent? If only she spoke with a bit more kindness, she might leave a different impression. Gosh! Shano and Kumasawa entered the hallway with a serving cart. Like, gosh, bro, she she's old as fuck. She she looks she looks old as shit. She looks old as shit. Please excuse us. Now then, let us move on to today's dessert. Goat and the others laid a beautifully adorned dessert out in front of us all. I guess it's true. They say you have another stomach for dessert. I thought I filled up on I thought I'd already filled up on delicious food, but as soon as I laid eyes on that dessert, my stomach started yelling. Please give me more. Give me more. I'm sorry. I don't know much about desserts, but this one looked really good. Hold on, my fault. I I'm like adjusting my recording. A white pudding like substance was garnished with two shades of red sauce and an elegant rose petal adorned the dish. Normally during a high class meal like this, you're supposed to wait for the chef to extol the virtues of this particular meal before eating. However, Maria was completely indifferent to strict rules like that. So she got excited by this beautiful and delicious looking dessert, jumping into the fray as soon as it was placed before her. Aunt Rosa scolded her calling it bad manners, but George responded saying, now, nah, now nah, it's okay. <laughs> this part's sour. <laughs> it's sour. Battler, this one's no good. She has sampled the two colored sauces. What? Some are good and some bad? Okay, I'll give it a go. Uh, mm. Apparently one sauce was sweet and the other sour. Despite it being bad manners, I also stuck my finger in and licked a, li licked a little. Whoa, one of the sauces was sour enough to make you pucker up. If it were yellow, I'd have suspected lemon, but... I couldn't guess the kind of sourness would be red. I decided to ask Shanan, who was putting away the serving cart behind us. 
What kind of, what kind of sauce is sour stuff? John unhesitated. She doesn't know. Oh my goodness. Maybe her job was just to set the table so she doesn't really know. Still, even considering that, she seems pretty stressed. Maybe I shouldn't have asked. Or did they use some ingredient that we'd be better off not knowing about? While Aunt Natsuki made a gesture that seemed to indicate an oncoming headache, Kumasawa, who was sitting at the table at the opposite seat, began to chuckle. What do you think we made it out of? Hold on. What do you think we made it out of? <laughs> It'll shock you. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Wait, hold on, Kumasawa. That laugh is kind of creepy. Don't tell me what it is, bro. Don't tell anyone, okay? Listen very carefully. Kumasawa leaned across the other side of the table. I leaned forward myself when she asked. Their interest caught Jessica. Their interest caught Jessica, George, and of course, Maria also put their ears closer. The souls of dead children. What? What? Quickly! Talk, nigga! You see, the sour part is made from... Juice squeezed from a mackerel. Mackerel? I don't think I've ever had mackerel. That's crazy, we all thought. Horrified. Only Maria accepted it, nodding sagely. Mackerels are sour. This is what comes out when you squeeze them. There we go, Maria with the common sense. When Maria started clamoring that macros were sour, the adults were unable to contain their laughter. Only Aunt Rosa, her face red, whispered to Maria that mackerel is sour only once prepared as shim, shimesaba. Ah, now I totally remember. Kumasawa was always like this, wasn't she? I think I remember her tricking me in all sorts of ways when I was young. The most lethal has got to be that one. Those flimsy black things in Chinese dishes? They're ki kikurage mushrooms. She told me they were penguin meat, and I went all around school like a smartass telling everyone, didn't I? You have not changed. Uh, you know Maria's gonna believe it now, right? It's just a joke. Now Goda's gonna tell us what the sauce really is, won't he? I see what she did. I see exactly what she did. She took the pressure off Shauna and then put it on Gota because she knew he was playing her. Kumasawa, she the goat. Gota looked a little put off by this master by his masterpiece being laughed at for such a bizarre reason. But after clearing his throat once, he introduced a dessert to us. Well then, allow me to introduce our dessert. After seeing how much you all enjoyed the Rose Garden earlier today, I finished this panna cotta in a Rose Garden style. The rose petals scattered across were selected just now from that very Rose Garden. The sauce is a combination of two reds, strawberry, and rose hips. Please enjoy this mixture of the strawberry sweetness and the rose hip sourness. <laughs> Furthermore, the rose petals are merely decorative, so please avoid them while you eat. With that said, please enjoy. Whoa, man, I almost want to applaud before eating. Just like when medicine, reading that, reading the detailed description first seems to make it work a whole lot better. As Goda elaborated on the details of this dessert, it started feeling to feel more appetizing. Seriously, should you call them subtle or just talented? The dessert was probably planned from the beginning, but taking the hint that when we all stopped in front of the Rose Garden earlier today, he displayed an incredible and timely awareness by just adding a few rose petals from that garden. This combination of sweet and sour was also exquisite. If it was just sweet, you'd just get used to it and bored halfway through. But if you reached the sour sauce at that point, you'd get a really vivid taste. And then once you return to the sweet sauce, all the sourness in your mouth would be replaced with an enjoyable sweetness. I'm sure everyone else felt the same way. 
Every time I go to pass by one of our seats, someone praise the taste in this presentation. How was it, madam? Shut the fuck up. <laughs> it's good, nigga. Go away. I don't feel like talking to you. Splendid, as always. It is worthy of entertaining our guests. I am most grateful for your words. Madam, did you know? I have heard that Rose Hip has the ability to cure headaches. I thought that you in particular would appreciate it, so I had it specially prepared. You motherfucker. Oh my goodness, fucking hell. Stop it, that line. Oh, you fucking piss me off, you piece of shit. Is that so? Thank you. <laughs> See, didn't I tell you not to eat? Rose hip is great for headaches. So it seems. I do hope it actually helps. Gona! I love ya! Hey, later on, why don't you tell me how they treat you here? Or if you can't, just let me know what sort of salary you'd like. Having your talent confined to this small island is sacrilege to humanity's cooking culture. What do you think about working your craft in my company and delighting all our customers? Hideyoshi. Are you trying to steal away our Goda? Now that won't do at all. We'd, be, we'd better start treating Gota better or he'll get snatched up. <laughs> yes, you really should. If you don't, someone's gonna grab him and you'll be stuck with three meals of Kumasawa-style mackerel cooking a day, won't you? Ooh, that's harsh. It seems someone's holding a grudge against me. Everyone let out a huge laugh. According to Jessica, Kumasawa's mackerel jokes were a running gag that our parents had long gotten used to. Kumasawa often claimed that mackerels had precious nutritional value, which could slow aging, make people smarter and more. Supposedly, while it couldn't stop the outward signs of aging, it helped, pre it helped prevent aging on the inside. Since she was still spirited enough to tell these kinds of jokes at her age, there must be something to that theory. In that case, if you'll excuse me, prepare yourself for tonight's dinner. I'll be cooking plenty of macro dishes for you all, so you better look forward to it. Uh -huh. We sure will. Can't wait to get all puckered up from tonight's shim shimasaba. That sounds wonderful. I wonder if they'll be serving any good Japanese sake. Oh, we certainly will. Haven't you heard of Rockin' Jima's famous macro chochu? Wahahaha. Kumasawa together with Shinon bowed and pushed the serving cart away. It was pretty fun to watch Gota, who looked like his show had been totally stolen, explain in a serious voice that we will be having calf steak for dinner. Kumasawa, thanks for doing that back there. As she pushed the servant car, Shinon bowed her head very deeply. Oh, I haven't done anything that requires thanks. Kumasawa may have played dumb, but she had obviously understood and saved Shinon in the nick of time. Back when Battler asked her about dessert, Shinon had unfortunately hesitated. There may have been several ways to dodge the question. But all of them would have required some quick wits, but she's stupid as fuck. Shinon, who hesitated when hard pressed for a response, was always suffering because of this small weakness. If only Shinon had a little had a little craft of the craftiness needed to cleverly shake off a mistake like Gota, her life would have been a bit easier. In fact, the fact that she could reform other tasks flawlessly made this weakness even more unfortunate. However, there were some who understood Shinon's honest nature. Her inability to gloss over a mistake and draw attention away from it. That was why Kumasawa had smoothly come to her rescue. I just heard from Genji that there will be a change in the afternoon shifts. 
I believe you were given a break until this evening. I'm jealous. Oh, sorry. I haven't checked the shift chart yet. Ah, yes. I was thinking I might start cooking some mackerel in the oven. If you don't mind, I would be happy if you would help out a bit before your break. Huh? I would be delighted to help. To shine on Kumasa was like a mother among the servants. You can't hate Kumasawa. Mm -hmm. The dining hall needed to be cleaned up so we were chased out. Instead, tea was being served in the parlor. Apparently, that had prepared the black tea that Aunt Rosa had bought for Aunt Nasuhi. Maria said she wanted to have some black tea, but my old bastard said she couldn't and told us children to go play outside. Battler, why don't we all go for a walk outside? Go ahead, take a look at the roses or something. But keep a close eye on the weather. The sky's still clear, but the weather report kept on talking about rain. I want to go to the beach, the beach! Oh, that sounds wonderful. Playing on a sandy beach is something you get to do often, is it? Ah, good point. Okay, let's all go to the beach then. Let's go, let's go! Maria, be careful not to get your clothes wet. Or your shoes. Shut up, bitch. Won't get wet. She's so adorable. That obedience is so cute. Battler, make sure you keep an eye out for Maria, okay? Sure, leave it to me. Hey, you're pretty obedient and cute yourself listening to Kyrie like that. Why don't you also listen to me obediently for a change? Ha. Hell no! Let's go, everyone. Come on. The children flew out of the parlor. <laughs> Every time this nigga pop up, he looks so funny. They were replaced by Genji, who pushed the serving cart in and prepared to serve the tea. The parlor was filled with a sublime aroma, which delighted everyone while they waited to sate their thirst. <laughs> Rudolph's family certainly seems close. It's a wonderful thing. Quit it. We're no match for your family. That's true. You've raised Jessica to be so adorable. I imagine that's a, yet another fruit of your talents at education and training, Natsuhi. Thank you. Not to he answered coldly, <laughs> she's like, fuck you. The conversation broke off then and the parlor fell silent. Maybe Hideyoshi couldn't bear the sound of because he broke it himself with an exaggerated gesture. Still, they sure do grow fast. I thought they'd be kids forever. But they start getting huge all of a sudden, then they're adults like us. Battler looks completely like a completely different person now. His body has grown much bigger, but he's still just a kid. Phil, you can say the same about my husband. I wonder where the border between child and adult is. I still don't feel as though I've grown up. Isn't that pitiful? That's not something the mother of a child should say. That's right. We're not children anymore. We're all adults now. So I wish we could talk together on an intellectual level, on an intellectual level rather than an emotional one. Is that another dig at Natsuhi? Leave that poor girl alone. When Ava smiled with sharp sarcasm, everyone seemed to get more tense. It felt as though the, a pleasant aroma that had been tossed out the window. Ava, leave her alone! Damn! 
Since long ago, we've always endeavored to engage in intellectual conversations. It seems your sarcasm occasionally misses its mark. Just as it always has. Oh, what is it you've always endeavored to do? My, my. I wish I could wrap those words up and send them to this room a few decades ago. Right, Rosa? <laughs> Leave me out of this. Rosa gave a vague smile. She knew that whether she disagreed or disagreed, she'd earn displeasure from one of her siblings. It was a bit of a worldly wisdom that had been essential for someone growing up as the youngest. Quit it. We better get started on our main topic while the breaths aren't around. Let us make that our intellectual discussion. As Rudolph glanced over the faces of all present, some let out a slight sigh and some let out a look of resignation across their face. They were approaching the unavoidable. True agenda. Last year, his life expectancy was estimated at about three months. Which I guess means he's got negative nine months left now. Should we take that to mean it might suddenly happen any time? The family head is still alive and well. The fact that you'd bring up such an inappropriate topic under the light of day makes me doubt your sanity, Rudolph. Still, Natsuhi. This is the sort of thing you can't put off until something... Un this is the sort of thing you can't put off until after something happens. He's still healthy now, which makes it the perfect time to talk about this. While we still got time to plan. It's just a bit of financial etiquette, you might say. It seems father is the focus of everyone's concern. Dr. Nanjo, could we hear the details from you? That appears to be what everyone else is waiting for, after all. <clears throat> Nanjo, who had been standing by the window and staring out, the, out at the Rose Garden, let out a single cough when he realized he, had, his, he was called. Nanjo Dr. Nanjo? How is father's condition? Well to, be well, to begin, allow me to start with the revision. Since my estimate last year that he only had three months left was not borne out. No need to explain. You're saying that measuring remaining life is only a prediction, not a promise, right? That is correct. Because of that, while I will accept everyone's repeated questions, I can be by no means to confirm when he will pass away. A human's life is supported by their body and their mind. If the body is weak, the situation becomes more dangerous. But if the mind is strong enough to compensate for that weakness, the effects of one's condition can sometimes remain in a subdued state. So you're saying that even if his body is weak, his mind is still firm and spirited. Kirie, sorry, but please stay quiet for a bit. I'm sorry. That is correct. Kinzo's body is being overwhelmed by the demon of ill health. This will hold especially true as long as he continues to partake in such strong alcohol. So he's in a crisis not because he drinks. And maybe he's lived this long because he's drink. Because he drinks. There's that for you, the heavy drinker. Well then, doctor. I know you can't give anything more than a prediction, but what do you think about father's chances of living until this day next year? That's quite a rude question to ask about the family head. Not so he jumped on Ava, not even bothering to hide her astonished expression. Ava stared back daringly, but Hideyoshi realized what was going on and tried to smooth things over with a forced smile. Ah, uh, Natsuhi, forgive her. Ava, choose your words a bit carefully now, okay? I'm sorry. I was just so concerned about father's condition. Is that so? I hadn't realized. I feel bad for Natsuhi, bruh. Dr. Nanjo, please tell us. For the sake of the beautiful love of, of a daughter worried about her father's lifespan, Krauss laughed sarcastically 
and Ava, sw smiling sweetly, returned an identical chuckle. You asked whether he'll still be healthy next year? But as a doctor, it is very hard to say. Because while I do think this lull in his condition will continue for a while, if he suffers some kind of fit, there's nothing we can do. After all, Rockin' Jima is a solitary island. It is not as though an ambulance could quickly jump in to save him. Normally, I would want to have him placed in a large hospital on the mainland, but... Bob has stated he does not want his noble research interrupted. Since he holds a grudge over the way we tried to force him out last year, apparently he strongly suspects that he'll be shut away in some hospital if he goes outside. And that's how things are now. Has Dr. Nanjo been in examining him? Father trusts Dr. Nanjo. It seems he could be examined when he's in one of his better moods. I can examine his condition, but if I try to recommend medicine or hospitalization, he refuses to listen. I've only really, I've only ever been able to look. It's true, some people hate doctors. Still, what a hassle. Nanjo sighed deeply. The purpose of an examination is to determine what medical treatment would be appropriate. Receiving an examination and then not following the advice given makes the whole thing pointless. So, to sum it up, he's still expected to live three months. There's no way to guess how long he'll continue to live while on the verge of death. Rudolph, could you be a little more discreet with your words? Ah, uh, sorry. I've always talked this way. Give me a break. I understand how Dr. Nanjo sees it. What about you, Kraus? Hmm. To be perfectly honest, I have to disagree with the Dr. Nanjo. I find it truly difficult to think Father as a person so sick that he only has three months left to live. His yell is as healthy as ever, and I still get chills at the thought of his fist raining down on me. Pushing the care of your father solely on the shoulders of the other sibling is far from fair. <laughs> I'm in the, in the next world, get born after me. Okay, let's get back on track. So in the opinion of our impartial and neutral doctor, it wouldn't be us for him to go anytime. No offense to you, Aniki, but I'd rather trust the opinion of an expert in his field. Which means it's definitely not too early to start talking about Dad's assets. Father's personal funds probably reach as high as several 10 billion yen, right? But it's not as though that's all neatly gathered as ready cash. It's not as simple as cutting a birthday cake with a knife. That's an interesting way to put it. That's right. You sometimes get strawberries or chocolates on top of the cake, making it hard to cleanly cut it into equal parts. Given that, don't you think it's better to discuss beforehand how best to stick the knife in? I cannot understand how you can all openly discuss this though the family head is dead even though we're still alive. Come on, don't you see how important this is? After all, when the time comes, the inheritance of his fortune must be carried out immediately, right? Moreover, the glorious Ushira Mia house's wealth is vast. Don't you understand that careful discussion is necessary beforehand? There's a huge difference between the family's resources and your family's wealth. How rude! My birth family has nothing to do with this! Nantuhi responded indignantly, though in a low voice, and the already dark atmosphere grew even more hostile. Give it a rest, Ava! Pardon her rudeness. Hideyoshi tried to smooth things over by glancing at both with a forced smile, but it only resulted in making the hostility between Ava and Natsu even more intense. I can't remember. Is Natsuhi like blood? 
Or is she married? Yeah, okay, she's married. Why is she so attached to the family head? Why is she so attached to Kingza? I mean, I'm sure we're gonna find out, but like, why does she care so much if her own husband doesn't care? Or maybe that's just her morality. Like, I know like the game is making her look crazy, but you gotta, okay, it's a Kanye West quote, all right? It, um, the truth sounds crazy in a world full of lies. And I, I, I kind of, this kind of makes me think of that because the way I see it, like, I understand what they're saying. Like, you gotta, you know, you gotta divide the, you gotta divide everything before he dies or else it's gonna be chaos. Like, this is a necessary conversation, but they're making her look crazy for wanting just a little bit of sensitivity for the matter. You feel me? Like, because I, I, bro, I would be, I would be exactly her. I'm gonna be real. In this exact situation, I would be exactly her. If they were talking this crazy about somebody that I probably cared about who was dying, I'd probably be like, I probably, I might not be acting like her, but I'd be thinking everything that she's saying at least, you know? But, it, and then like, they be dogging her, dog. And it's sad, like they be dogging her. Like, I know she's stressed out. I know, I know she's got some pop veins. Hideyoshi tried to smooth things over by glancing at both with a forced smile, but it only resulted in making the hostility between Ava and Nasha even more intense. It seems I'll just get in the way if I stay any longer. Please excuse me. He got out of there. I want nothing to do with this. Nanjo rose from his seat and exited the parlor. To an outsider, it may have seemed like a perfectly normal act of courtesy, but his back was watched by several glances envy of his ability to escape. After the doctor exited, his footsteps had disappeared into the distance. Krauss recrossed his legs. In other words, this is what you would all like to say. Father's remaining life is short. You want to quickly enter into a practical conference concerning the distribution of, his, of the inheritance. Why are you so eager, I wonder? Certainly, as you say, estimating and distributing the Oshirimiya family is no simple task. In that case, should we make careful and deliberate calculations? It seems to me you are all impatient to split up the cake tonight. Isn't that true, Rosa? What a reason is there to be hasty? We aren't being hasty. However, we need to have an agreement between the siblings. It doesn't matter when we do that. But if the day father's conditions were to worsen is approaching, discussing the matter beforehand hardly seems hasty to me. Rosa shot a glance at Ava and Rudolph. As the youngest sibling in the family, it was hard for her to be cross-examined by the eldest. Is that your true opinion? I didn't expect that the most honest and pure heart of the siblings would say something like that. I wonder if those two told you to say it. Quit it. Rosa's one of dad's kids too. She's got, she's got as much right to his inheritance as the rest of us. It's only natural that she'd be interested. After all, dad'll definitely die, and that's not something that'll happen in the distant future. On the contrary, you're way too relaxed. It's almost as though you'd like nothing better than to turn the discussion away from the inheritance issue. What do you mean by that? Are you trying to accuse my husband of something? C calm down, Natsuki, calm down. Listen to what we have to say. Man, they are putting that poor girl through the ringer. I hear times have been extremely good lately. Yeah, since last year, we've been in an unprecedented boom and the yen keeps on rising. It seems that it's no longer a dream that the dollar will reach 100,000 yen. Also, that ruling party says that it'll establish health resort maintenance law by next year. At this moment, resort development companies across Japan are running about, trying to gather as much funding as they can. You certainly seem to know a lot about it. 
Japan is about to experience an unprecedented boom. It'll be a repeat of the Korean War demands, the time during which father revived the Yoshiromiya family. The people of Japan have been working like mad, achieving vast economic growth and becoming the most well-loved people in the world, reaching the height of our prosperity. We've reached an era where private spending is vast, which means easy money for institutions that can capitalize on the facts. The three kinds of electrical appliances no longer represent the people's needs. The people need ski resorts, golf courses, public pools, resort hotels, and theme parks. Have you gone to De Delsneyland, which opened just a few years ago? What an excellent theme park. It's a place where even an adult can be a kid and have fun with his family. No longer do we count our sole virtue to be selfless devotion to be selfish devotion while failing to care for our families. We have become the most prosperous people of the, in the world, and now we can finally enjoy our, the benefits. Krauss, your foresight is nothing to sneeze at. When I heard that sort of thing several years ago, I thought it was crazy. But when I heard that the G5 nations, Plaza Accord, that all changed. The yen shot up and I bet the price of land skyrocketing soon too. It won't be long before Japan becomes an economic center of the world. You've got a great sense of direction the world's moving. you got a great sense of the direction the world's moving, Kraus. At least there could be no debate about that. I feel the same as Hideyoshi. You can read into the next decade of history. I'll bet you got that keen sense from Dad. And it's incredible. However, unlike Dad, the timing of your predictions has been a bit off sometimes, right? You've been starting resort projects everywhere, convinced that Japan will soon see a boom, but almost all of them continue to fail. Well, I'm sure that the era you predicted will soon arrive. It seems you've misread the timing of that boom. You were too early. You then panicked and tried to sell everything off, which only opened the wound even further. If your nose was really so reliable, then there should be a reason for you to sell off your property. There should be no reason for you to sell off your property. Is this proof that you mistrust your own ability? How rude! Are you trying to insult my husband? Nasui's forehead creased as she rose from the sofa. Ava, paying this no heed, stared at Kraus with a confident smile. Kraus, who also maintained his confident appearance, told Natsui to sit down. Please, stop, Natsui. Ava's always been incapable of talking any other way. Calm down a little, or your headache will get worse. There's proof of your lack of talent right next to us. After all, weren't you excited about turning this island into a resort? You built a wonderful resort hotel and beautifully maintained the garden. I'm just an amateur, so don't pre I'm just an amateur and don't pretend to understand. But you must have used a significant amount of money for that, right? And what is that to you? My husband's business is none of yours! Actually, that's not true, Natsuhi. Rokinjima doesn't belong to Anaki. It belongs to Dad. Of course, the hotel does belong to him, right? In fact, we'd be more willing to pay lodging fees for tonight. What do you think, Rosa? Well... If what I have on hand will suffice... If I can make it into a resort, the island's finances are worth will rise. It is true that expenses have piled up, but we can expect a large a large harvest in the future. When that happens, all of you will stand a profit as well, do you not? I understand that. If the value of this island rises, that'll increase our portions when we distribute the inheritance. Of course, I won't ask you to divide the island and the mansions into four equal parts. We can just resolve the matter with equal, with money equal to the value of property. If you understand that much, what about my business makes you so dissatisfied? 
We aren't all dissatisfied. We aren't dis we aren't dissatisfied. We're uneasy. In the first place, when do you plan to open that hotel? Left this way, you won't get anything out of it except our grubby handprints, right? That's right. It's an important tool for your business, isn't it? Surely you can't keep it locked up until the moment you open it. Buildings go bad when you don't use them and air them out every once in a while. Even so, it's a bit extravagant for a guest house that we only use once a year. Right, Rosa? Leave that girl alone! Dang! That's right. Considering how wonderful it is, I'm sure it will become, I'm sure it will become quite popular once you open it. So the hotel you keep talking about is a guest house. It's splendid. Just like just as Rosa said, if you were to open it, I'm sure it would become popular. The lodging they that they had been guided to, the lodging they had been guided to wasn't originally intended to serve as a guest house. It was originally constructed as a resort hotel. However, even though it was built two years previously, there was still absolutely no prospect of it opening. It's just like all of your enterprises. Your attention and planning are both fabulous. Then it always becomes an unmaintainable, always become unmaintainable part way through, and ends before you have a chance to earn any profit. You were brilliant when you saw that using this island only as a place to live was a waste. I think it was pretty good plan to turn it into a resort that could use the prospect of marine sports, fishing, honeymoons, and the like to attract customers. If I were the oldest son, I'm sure I'd strain my brain looking for a way to make profit off this island. But two full years have passed since you finished building, right? After two years, you still haven't had the opportunity to open it. Where's the managing company you entrusted it to? Impertinence! That is not my husband's fault! There has just been some trouble with the company that my husband contracted with. No matter how you look at it, we are victims here. And yet, the rumors we heard about this company you hired haven't been good at all. Let's be clear about this, dear. Did you really think we wouldn't hear about how lack of payment, embezzlement, and other issues led to the project disintegrating mid-flight? We even have evidence. I don't know what kind of evidence you think you found, but it's all baseless. As new members of the tourism industry, it is necessary for us to lay the groundwork with various people. It is also important to investigate the trustworthiness of our partners. It's merely taking us some time to meet that goal. I'll admit, in my rashness, the hotel was completed too early. However, it's not as though we're paying maintenance costs. It's a foundation that will eventually become immensely significant. Liar. I'll bet you want to liquidate it but can't. After all, there's no reason for anyone to buy such an extravagant hotel on an isolated empty island without any established sightseeing routes. And anyway, what about all the loans you made for this project? Even if you aren't even if you aren't even if you aren't incurring maintenance costs, the borrowed money the that borrowed money that you can't return just keeps growing. Sorry, Kraus. But I've investigated the development plan for this island a bit. To be honest, I haven't heard anything good either. I can see how you might be left with the impression by looking only at the current financial situation. However, this is a forward-looking investment. I have no choice but to admit that my prediction was mistaken, and that up to, until this point, several liabilities have been created. However, the times have finally caught up with me. I will soon regain everything that I have lost up to this point. No, actually. All of the investments I have made up until now will finally return to my possession. That's right. Just like throwing away a small fry, which then becomes a salmon. They will come back even bigger than before. 
I'll accept that. The resort business will probably see an unprecedented boom before long. Though I don't know if it'll be enough to cover all your debt. However, Kraus, after all your failures in the past, who do you ex who exactly do you expect to provide you with funding? And this isn't in some small amount we're talking about. You'll need enough funding to fill the massive hole you've dug. What are you trying to say, Hideyoshi? Ah, uh, Natsuhi, please don't get angry. We looked into this too. We checked to see who might have provided Kraus with enough financial support in his recent large scale projects despite his string of failures. And we discovered that no such backer exists. The iron rule of the minor roulette is that you bet against the loser. You're a fairly well-known loser in this field. It's true that prosperous times are about to come, but when we look for people who considered that long enough to overlook your string of failures, and also had enough for this in to for the investment, we found no candidates. So, the big question now is where you got that money from. Now isn't this intriguing? And? How long do you plan to let these ridiculous remarks stand? Sit down, Natsuhi. Let's cut to the point. You've been diverting Dad's private funds for your own businesses. There's pretty much no room for doubt. If you think we made some kind of mistake, please feel free to explain. Rudolph, don't call it diverting funds. This is embezzlement, plain and simple. A huge crime that can be criminally prosecuted. This sort of rudeness cannot be tolerated! How can you face the successor of the Yoshiro Miyad family and leave these and level these absurd accusations? They aren't absurd, they're right on the mark. I'm sure he'd like to somehow make his business succeed and recover his losses, but his debt keeps getting bigger. He's just trying to cover up the failure of what he can but by making an even bigger one. It's only natural that he'd grab any source of funding close at hand. Let me be frank, Nee. Let me be frank. What you're doing is embezzlement. You're betraying father. You know that we'll have the court settle this after it's all over, right? Do you think that kind of person has any right to call themselves the successor of the Oshira Mia head family? Of all the- You dare claim that, the, that he has betrayed the family head? You no longer have any right to straddle the threshold of the glorious Oshira Mia family! Leave this place at once! Now! Get out! Natsuhi, who had reached the limits of her anger, shouted at Ava in a rage. I need water again, man. My throat is sore. Natsuhi, who had already reached the limits of her anger, shouted at Ava in a rage. She then pointed alternatively at Ava in the hallway, demanding that she leave. Ava took out a folding fan and fanned herself with it, glaring maliciously at Natsuhi as though silently daring her to repeat what she said. However, her mouth was still smiling, curved in the shape of a crescent moon. In that unpleasant silence, Rosa gulped. To whom do you think you're speaking in that such a tone? I am speaking to the exceedingly rude sister of my husband. As the person in charge of the main family's kitchen, I cannot overlook any more of this bitch. You are in charge of a kitchen. You have zero authority. In charge of the kitchen? I'm sorry, you walked into that one. You walked you. Natsuhi, Natsuhi, I do feel bad for you. I feel like they treating you way worse than they really should be. You know? I really feel that way. But in charge of the kitchen? You think that holds weight? 
Oh shit. Oh shit, hold on. In charge of the kitchen? <laughs> Be silent! Lowly maid servant! Oh, she's pissed. Ava folded the fan with a snap and rose to her feet energetically. Compared to the elegance and playfulness she'd sown a, until a second ago, she was now unimaginably aggressive. How foolish. You stand down! Before Ava of the Ushirimiya family. You tell me to stand down? Me? Ushirimiya Ava? The third ranked in the Ushirimiya family hierarchy and the only one allowed to sit at the left shoulder of the head? Know your place! And then look at your shabby self in the mirror. Where is the symbol of the wing on your clothes? Where are you permitted to wear the one winged eagle? Aren't you nothing more than a borrowed womb to, the, to house the next successor of the Oshiramiya family? Understand your place, you common housemaid. Ava's face twisted hideously as her words gouged into Natsumi's heart like talons, wrenching at it. There were a hundred ways Natsumi wanted to respond. However, her anger and sorrow crushed her throat, and none of those words managed to make it to her mouth. Her anger had nowhere to go, and became a single hot tear that slowly dripped down. What's wrong? If you have something to say, please do so. Oh, this bitch looks evil. Come on! Ava faced her with a provocative gaze. However, Natsuhi could do nothing but tremble, her, cl her clenched fist quivering. Krauss quietly broke that powder keg tension. Natsuhi, leave your seat. You should go cool your head. What? Natsuhi, resenting the fact that her husband had not come to her aid, shifted the focus of her attack. Dear, don't you understand what they're saying about you? These people are baselessly calling you a traitor to father. They're making light of the fact that we protect the glory of the Oshiramiya family, even though they are constantly expending every effort to earn that glory from father. They trample all that they trample all of that underfoot with their hateful rambling. And you don't even try to fight back. Why? I'm only standing up for us because you won't. But you've been putting the entire burden on me for some time now. And now you tell me to go cool my head? It's always me! Even though I have always considered this family's affair so seriously, you Ah, oh, man. Not till he was unable to hide her tears. She flew from the room in that state. Under all that, under, after that, all that remained was a somewhat embarrassed mood about the parlor. When the sound of footsteps grew distant and silence returned, Krauss shrugged his shoulders slightly. I apologize for my wife. She has always been a bad, bad at controlling her emotions. You a bitch. You, you, you for real a bitch, bruh. You for real a bitch. You steal from your dying daddy. Waste his fucking money on bullshit that does not help out or do shit for you or your wife or your kid. And then, when your siblings dog your ass for it, not only do you act stupid about it, but you sit there and watch your wife defend you to the last fucking breath until she's eventually berated and embarrassed in front of everybody. And you can't even work up the nerve to be a man and stand up for your wife. You a bitch, bruh. You a bitch ass nigga. I don't fuck with you, dog. And not to mention that, apparently, according to how the story's been going so far, Natsuhi has been under so much stress because he just cannot do his fucking job. Like, you don't do shit. You legit, no, he's legit leaving everything in his wife's hands and just not making, not, not, not being, this nigga's useless. 
Kenzo was right about you, bro. You gotta show. You gotta show me something later on. You gotta show me something. I apologize for my wife. She's always been bad at controlling her emotions. It's even been rough for me. If that's what's been managing your household, you must suffer to no end. Ava, fuck you too. I like you because you're funny sometimes, but you're an asshole. <laughs> Treating Natsuhi like that. She don't deserve this. She doesn't deserve this. Damn, that's pissing me off. It's nothing. Leave me be. Not till he flew into her room and threw herself onto her bed, lamenting. Those heart wrenching sobs reached Kumasawa in the hallway. Poor Madam Natsui. There is a deep enmity between her and Ava. Explaining their relationship would be very trying for me as a woman. The Ushiro Mia family holds blood in high regard. But if a woman marries and leaves the family, they are normally removed from the family register. Thus, under normal circumstances, Ava should have been removed from the family when she married Hideyoshi. However, there is no one deserving of blame for this matter. The madam certainly bears no guilt. There's nothing to call it other than a whim of God. Kraus and Natsuhi were not blessed with children for some time. After all, this is the male dominant Ushirimiya family. A wife is merely a tool to create an heir. If such a wife cannot fulfill her duty, she will not even be treated as a human. It pains me to remember how the master tortured Madam during that time. Back then, a wedding between Ava and Hideyoshi was being discussed. Ava was sly, taking advantage of Madam's inability to become pregnant as she gained the favor of the master. She inspired him to allow her to marry and give birth to a successor herself, making sure only to making sure to avoid transferring her name out of the Ushira Mia register. There was a vast difference in the Ushira Mia hierarchy between Madam, who married into the Ushira Mia family and was treated like an outsider, and Ava, who was treated to the family by blood, who was related to the family by blood, and whose husband took only the Ushira Mia family name. Furthermore, Ava actually gave birth first, and to a boy. As for how much weaker Madam's position was than Ava, well, I believe you can see for yourself. I'm sure Madam is tormented by the thought of that. If only she had gotten pregnant earlier, the Master wouldn't have accepted Ava's request to keep her last name after marriage. Ava wouldn't have been permitted to act so arrogantly as she did today. However, that was not Madam's fault. All of this blame, all of the blame lies with God's whims and the stork that delivered Jessica late. Even so, Madam won't allow herself to see things this way. She probably can't help but cry bitter tears as a woman at her inability to carry out the duties expected of a wife. How sad. I cannot do anything except watch over her from the shadows. That scared me last time, but I was ready for it. I was ready for it. That's the end of the episode, guys. If y'all enjoyed, like, subscribe, leave a comment. I'll read them all. Tap into the next one. Um, man, I really feel bad for Natsuki, bro. I know I've been saying it all episode. I feel so bad for her, man. Uh, and then knowing her actual backstory now, like knowing her backstory, I feel even worse. Like, this is actually just fucked up what they're doing to her. They're treating her so shittily. And it's like, and it's not her fault. Like, that's legit just bullshit. And Ava, like, you already fucked up her position. Why do you gotta keep rubbing this shit in, Ava? I, I like Ava because she's funny. Like, you know, she's funny. Some she, A lot of times she's funny. She says shit sarcastically and it's, it's goofy and it's silly. But like, oh man, the way she treats Natsuki just is pissing me off. Like, 
Come on, man. But that's good characterization, you know? Like, characters can't be one di two dimension. Is it one or two? I don't remember. Characters can't be two dimensional like this, you know? They've gotta be 3D. And just because a character can be silly and sweet with the kids and always being funny and, you know, making people laugh, that doesn't mean that they can't single somebody out and be an asshole when they can and be cruel. So, you know, that I feel like that's good storytelling, but man, it just hurts my heart. But peace out. I love y'all. Tap into the next one.